Welcome back. So we've been talking about compressed sensing and sparsity, and I'm really excited in this lecture to code this up in MATLAB for kind of a toy version of an audio signal, okay? So you can actually use this idea of compressed sensing in the real world to reconstruct audio signals and images even if you don't have the full, uh, the full measurement resolution, even if you don't measure the full image or the full audio signal. And this is especially useful in sampling signals in time because there's a really, really important result that you can actually beat the Nyquist sampling limit uh, in, in practice if the signal that you're sampling, your audio signal that you're sampling in time, or whatever signal you're sampling in time, is sparse in a Fourier transform basis. So this is really fun when you go to a conference and you tell people you can beat the, the Nyquist sampling theorem. I mean, this is one of the most important results in all of signal processing for the last 100 years. All of you know, digital uh, communication is kind of built on the Shannon-Nyquist uh, sampling theorem and in information theory. And so people are very skeptical until you break it down for them. So those fundamental limits, uh, kind of that Nyquist sampling limits, is for information-dense signal, uh, signal sampling and transmission, okay? But the minute that your signal S is uh, the, the signal that you're sampling is sparse in some basis, like a Fourier transform or a wavelet transform basis, you can actually beat Nyquist and you can reconstruct signals even if you don't sample them at the, at the, um, the, the kind of the rate that you would normally need to based on, on Nyquist theorem, okay? And I'm, I'll probably have another lecture on what the, the Shannon-Nyquist sampling theorem actually is and how it works. Uh, in signal processing classically, but for now, kind of, I'm just gonna walk you through this example, okay? Our toy example, we're going to cook up an audio signal that basically has two tones, okay? So we have a 97 hertz and a 7 and 7, 777 hertz audio signal, and I'm adding those two cosines together to get this two-tone uh, audio signal. Okay, and we're gonna. This is gonna be a really small example, so I can run it on my laptop live uh, in this demo. But you could do this on larger signals uh, if you scale this up to to bigger computers. Okay, we're gonna have a. 4,096 sample uh, high resolution audio signal. So kind of the truth that we're gonna compare against is gonna have just over 4,000 measurements, okay? <clears throat> and I'm gonna create a uh, kind of evenly sampled time vector T, uh, lens space zero to one uh, with n data points. And so that means that my high resolution sampling is gonna be uh, basically 4,000 hertz, okay? 4,096 samples per second. But then what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that we only have, you know, a very few of those samples spread out, not nearly at that high sampling rate. And we're going to see, can we infer what the original uh, audio signal was, even from massively downsampled measurements in Y? Okay, so this should be pretty cool. Uh, and then I'm just going to do some basic computations like the power spectrum so you can see how everything looks. Okay, so the original... Um, Okay, and then what I'm gonna do here, I showed you this randomly sampled signal. I'm only gonna measure 128 of those 4096 points, uh, and that's gonna be my downsampled measurement Y. So this is way below the Nyquist sampling limit uh, for this 777 hertz uh, cosine wave. Normally I would need to, to sample much more than 128 samples per second. Okay, but the catch here is that these 128 samples per second are randomly sampled, and I have an ex I'm assuming that I have an extremely precise timestamp of when they were sampled. So I, I'm only collecting 128 measurements per second, so 128 hertz on average, but I know exactly where they occurred in time up to 4096 uh, hertz accuracy, up to, up to this resolution in time. So I'm going to let you think about that. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, okay? So we're going to run this. We have randomly sampled 128 of those measurements, and now I'm just going to plot kind of what this looks like. So here you can see, uh, this is just a zoom in of a fraction of the second, so you can see it uh, in time of this two-tone uh, signal. So it's got a high frequency and a low frequency. And I think you can see here these red Xs are where I'm actually, these are my random sampling points. So you can see that there's some regions where there's, there's very little being sampled, and then there's other regions where I'm sampling 
quite a lot. And again, because these are the catch is that if this was uniformly sampled at 128 hertz, this would absolutely fail. I guarantee it would fail if I uniformly sampled at 120 hertz. But because I am randomly picking 128 points in time, some of them end up being rather close together. So these are actually pretty close together points. Others will be relatively far apart, and you'll get this kind of random spacing. So you'll still be exciting a lot of frequencies uh, with the sampling, whereas if you uniformly downsample to 128 hertz, you'd basically just alias anything at higher frequencies. So again, this is kind of some intuition for why we're able to beat the Nyquist sampling theorem. Uh, and we'll, we'll come back to that. And again, in, uh, in the frequency domain, the power spectrum, you can see that there's clean two peaks, because this is a two-tone uh, two tone cosine wave. And now we're actually going to run <clears throat> the compressed sensing optimization. We're basically going to solve uh, for the minimum one norm solution S that satisfies my system of equations, okay? Um, you know, theta S equals Y. And in the book, uh, in data, in our data book, you can find this at databookuw.com, uh, and there's a link to the PDF uh, in the comments. You can go to this, this section where we actually derive this and figure out how I define theta and how I define y and how I define s for this particular problem. Okay, But here I'm just going to run this optimization, and it might take a little while. Here we're using the cosamp code. This is a compressed sampling by matching pursuit. That's the compressed sampling matching pursuit. Matching pursuit is basically a greedy algorithm that allows you to solve this kind of an optimization uh, very, very fast and very effectively. Um, I will probably have a video on, uh, on uh, matching pursuit and greedy algorithms at some point in the future. Okay, so, so I, think it's, I think it's solved it, actually. And now I'm going to add the compressed sensing results. Okay, so from that L1 solution S, this is the sparse S vector that was solved for by this uh, matching pursuit algorithm. So this is the sparse solution to the system of equations that are consistent with those 128 uh, random measurements in time that I took up here. Okay, I get this sparse vector. Now this example works because my vector S is ultra, ultra sparse. It is too sparse. It has two non-zero entries uh, at these two frequencies here. So it's really easy to find a very, very sparse solution S that satisfies, that's consistent with those 128 random points in red. Okay, uh, And that's also why this, this cosamp runs quickly and is accurate and gets me the sparse solution. And then when I inverse Fourier transform that sparse solution, I recover in red. This is what I think the solution is, the sparse solution is, when I, when I go back to the time domain. So even if I had only these red points, but I knew exactly where they occurred in time, and they were somehow randomly spread out, I would be able to solve for the sparse Fourier coefficients, inverse Fourier transform, and recover my two-tone audio signal. And in a nutshell, that's how compressed sensing works. You have these random measurements, these red measurements, many, many fewer than you would traditionally need, but because they're randomly spread out and you know exactly where they are at exactly what time, you can solve this underdetermined system for a sparse vector S. That's our sparse power spectrum right there. And then you can inverse Fourier transform and get the original signal, uh, signal X. Okay? <clears throat> so again, you need to have the timing of your random samples. Uh, very, very precisely measured. You also need to be able to possibly have two of those measurements occur right next to each other, one delta t apart, uh, one very small delta t apart. But your average sampling rate can be uh, much, much lower if your system is sparse and um, uh, if, if your system is sparse in the Fourier domain and you have this precise timing of your measurements. Okay, so that's a really, really cool example of how you can beat the Shannon Nyquist sampling rate uh, using compressed sensing if your measurements are random uh, and you use this, this L1 minimization. Okay, all right, thank you.